question was this. Should the church sing only the Psalms as it had been? Or was it okay to sing these new man-made hymns? Well, around the same time, this hymn writer by the name of Isaac Watts came onto the scene. Maybe you've heard of him. The story goes that many of these churches, in order to compromise a bit, uh, would often sing the Psalms during the early part of the service, and then they would end the service with one of these new hymns. And of course, those who did not wish to sing these new hymns were known to get up and actually march their way out in protest while this hymn was being sung. Imagine that. <laughs> well, Isaac Watts sat down one day in response to this issue, and he wrote the lyrics to what we would probably consider one of the greatest Christian hymns. And I want you to hear those lyrics, the lyrical genius that he was. Come we that love the Lord, and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord, and thus surround the throne. And in verse 2, he gets a jab in. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children of the heavenly King may speak their joys abroad. And oh, how I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. The day the church joyfully sang, Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. We're marching to Zion while these parishioners made a scene by marching out of the church in protest. It's a great story for a great hymn. Perhaps you will see in our parable today a group somewhat similar uh, to this group of parishioners. We read the first two verses that uh, really sets the framework for Jesus' three parables that follow. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered or grumbled, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now there are some familiar personalities here that we see throughout Luke's gospel. The tax collectors and the sinners, uh, it says earlier in Luke, accept God's ways. And the Pharisees and teachers of the law, it says, reject God's purposes. And we saw this a bit in chapter 14 last week with the parable of the great banquet. But we also read in chapter 14 uh, that it concludes with this call, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And we open up our chapter this morning with this division between these two groups, with those who have gathered to hear Jesus, the sinners, and these righteous few who were gathering to hear themselves grumble about Jesus. And with this, again, the stage is set for Jesus' three parables. The one we will focus on today being the parable of the lost sheep. And in it, you're familiar with the story. There's a shepherd who has lost one of his sheep, and he's faced with this predicament. Do I stay here with the 99, or do I go after this one that has been lost? And for him, it's really not much of a question, is it? Of course, of course, you go after the one. And as we read, when he finds it, he, he takes special care of it. He cares for it in a very special way, picking it up and carrying it home on his shoulders. Well, in this, I think it's appropriate to try to hear what Luke's readers may have heard in this instance. Perhaps they would have heard the prophet Ezekiel prophesying against the shepherds of Israel. Let's hear it together out of Ezekiel 34. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel! who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with the wool, and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not care for the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, or healed the sick, or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays, or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. But then a word of hope for the lost sheep, as we keep reading. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. I am against the shepherds and will hold them accountable for my flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. Ezekiel paints this beautiful picture of a God 
who searches for and cares deeply for the lost sheep of Israel. And in our parable today, the lost sheep has been found. And it ends just as it should in a great celebration. There's great rejoicing for what was once lost has been found. And maybe we hear, come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. And yet there is for us, I think, a bit of sadness. Because we remember verse 2. We remember, and then in that we see the designated shepherds of Israel. We see these 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law grumbled. As the shepherds of Israel continued to feed themselves, never to join in the celebration. And in this, I think there's a message to us about the gospel and about those who wish to be a part of God's kingdom. And that's this. The kingdom of God is not for those who gather seeking to self-righteously glorify themselves. The gospel is an invitation to the lost who have come to hear and be carried home by the shepherd to join in a great celebration. Now, I think it's appropriate for us to ask, in hearing this today, what kind of behavior would cause one to speak this parable today? To tell the story of finding something that was once lost and joining in a great celebration? Well, seminary and seminarians have received a bit of a bad name in a lot of circles. Right? Those exiting seminary often get into churches, and it seems that we, we just seem to critique everything that's going on, right? Sometimes before we really even know what's actually going on. And don't get... And there is a place for it. But it seems at times there's a temptation for us to show up on Sunday morning not to join the people of God in celebration through hearing the word of the Lord, but rather just to hear ourselves grumble in all of our vast knowledge. Why is this guy up there leading the communion thought or teaching class or speaking in chapel? He doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> he's not qualified for that. And, no, why do you call it the welcome? Goodness, doesn't call to worship, it just sounds so much better. Use call to worship or this order of worship thing. Really, why can't we call it a liturgy? On and on and on they go and where they stop. Nobody knows. <laughs> or maybe I'm telling more about myself than I am about you. It's a bit self-incriminating. But do you hear the sound of it? Again, there's a place for criticism, but when criticism comes in the form of constant grumbling, that in some self-righteous way always seeks to tear others down and lift ourselves up, actually placing ourselves above the church just looking down on it and, and keeping us from joining in the church and joining in the celebration of Christ's body to the Father, well, then maybe it would be appropriate for us to hear this parable again today. To hear the story of a shepherd who searched for this one lost sheep and carried it home on his shoulders, and in that, to see Jesus. To hear the story of the lowest of the low, the tax collectors and sinners who came to hear and in that to see the church. Or maybe to know that there are those within our congregations who have come indeed to hear, not our own grumbling, but a word from God. To know that there are those who are lost and need one willing to carry them home. And perhaps we would do well to hear it again. To know, to know that the gospel is an invitation to the lost who have come to hear and to be carried home by the shepherd to join in a great celebration, to join in a song with sweet accord and thus surround the throne. May it be so with us today.